Hello, everybody. It is good to see you. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Woo! Woo! Hey, live streamers, welcome. It is so good to have you. Don't fire up your grill yet. Let's listen to a message, then you can fire your grill up. Hey, we have many different people that are watching live stream. They are from Nevada, North Carolina, California, Florida, South Carolina, Washington, D.C., Tennessee, Missouri, Virginia, Texas, Hawaii. It's got to be hard to watch television in Hawaii. And then lastly, the Philippines. So hopefully if you're watching... Hopefully, if you're watching, when I mention your state or country, you just yelled real loud wherever you were. So thank you for being here with us. Uh, you know, the great thing about me being up here, I'm one of the pastors at Freedom House, is, uh, well, that's not, <laughs> the great thing about being up here is not just the fact that I'm standing up here. The great thing about being up here is that this represents the fact that our pastors get to go and connect and do ministry in other places. And that's just what they're doing. They've been speaking not only in the United States, but in other countries and just really ministering to other uh, churches and being able to spread the love. Now, here's the reality of this. This is hard to grasp sometimes. The reality is, is that when our senior pastors go and share their gift and share what God's speaking through them, is that you and I, the ones that call Freedom House our home, that that makes us a part of that and we go with them. So therefore, I want you to clap for yourselves because you now have a global impact, not just local, all right? So give it up for yourself. So we always miss them, so we look forward to their return. But we're going to get into this series today. It's called uh, Pigs and Pearls. Uh, might sound like an interesting topic, so let me read to you where we got the title of this series from. It actually is biblical. It's uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. And Matthew 7, verse 6 says this, Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. Now, let me take the literal illustration of that. Let's just look at it literally. If I had a pearl, a literal pearl, and I threw it down and, and I had a pig that trampled it, the pig's not going to chase me because the next morning, me and my family are going to be eating bacon. <laughs> All right, let's get that. So it's not literal. This is, is, is an analogy, it's figurative, it's giving us uh, a, a life, real life example to really teach us a different principle. And we want to talk about that principle, so we want to focus on this idea of pearl. A pearl is something that is precious. A pearl in our life is something that we care for, it's something that we have great intentionality towards making sure that it's safe and secure. If it's really important to us, then we're very careful on who we share it with, who we talk about it with, who we give it to because we don't want it trampled underfoot because it means a whole bunch to us. So that's what we're talking about this series are the things in life, not a tangible pearl, but the things in life that God has given us that he really desires to be pearls that we really take great care of. Now, before I get into the pearl that I'm going to mention today, I need uh, my volunteers to come up here. You know who you are. So volunteers, run up, run up. There we go. Yeah, come on. He said, running. What in the world? <clears throat> All right. Now, if I asked you, just stand right there, thank you. If I asked you which one of these two bottles you would prefer to drink the water out of, which one would you say? Now, hold on before you answer that question. Uh, can you do me a favor? And if each of you could just drink some of the water, that'd be great. Yeah, he's, he's mad because he's the last one, which I don't blame him. <laughs> Come on, take it, take it, take it, take it. <laughs> he said, you got a girlfriend. <laughs> All right, let's give it up for these guys as they go down. Y'all can go on down. Thank you very much. <laughs> Whew, nothing refreshing like three other people that have drank out of water. All right, now I want to ask you, how many of y'all would drink out of this bottle that we just all drank from and I spit back in? Nobody. The reality is, is that you know, you might not know whether or not we have any diseases or infections, and we don't, but you know that there have been a lot of people here, and there's another cleaner option that the seal hadn't been broken on, and so I'm going to take this one all day. Well, the reality of this illustration is, is that we really all, if we have the choice, we desire purity. And so the nugget we're going to talk about today and the pearl we're going to talk about is purity. The reality is, is that in some area of our life, even if it's just this example of water, 
In some area of our life, at some level, we all really desire the best of the best, the purest form of something. We desire purity. You know, there are certain things you get from the store that if you get them generic, oh my gosh, like a paintbrush. You get a generic paintbrush, you've had a bad day. You need to get the purest, best one. Get the one that costs $7. It'll pay off in the long run. Also, in our food. We like the purest food. The word, if they put, they could put organic uh, on a bag of Cheetos and we would go, oh yeah, that's organic. I'm eating that. <laughs> like that word alone makes us go, because oh, we want the purest thing. You know, you hear something is free range. You know, our deer meat we eat is free range because I hunt it out on the range. <laughs> but even in technology, we want the newest updated, the best of the best we want everything in our relationships. We want the purest, best relationship that we can have. When it comes to, to watching movies, we want to see, we don't want maybe the remake. I don't know if I want remake. Why did y'all have to do seven of the same show? The first one was the best. It was the purest. Why did you keep it going and ruining it? You ever read a book and then watch the movie? A lot of people love books more than the movie because it's the pure. It expounds. It gives all the detail. We desire purity, at least at some level in some arena of life. Now, the problem and the issue with this is that a lot of the times I tend to define purity as something that is external that I can see on the outside. Meaning that if I have my clothes together and I have my makeup on and I look fit and I look together and I'm smiling real big and I'm just happy and I seem that way, then I automatically think that, man, that person right there, they've got it going on. They must have the best life that ever created. But the reality is, is when I read the Bible, I realize that that's not true. Purity is not external. I realized real quickly when I read the Bible that there are a gazillion strip scriptures that talk about our heart. And that led me to go, you know what? Purity is not external. God's perspective is, is purity is actually internal. It is something that comes from within inside us because you can look at something that looks good on the outside. It doesn't necessarily mean it's good on the inside. Now, if something's good on the inside, then it's going to produce a great outside. Let me give you an example of this external versus, versus internal. So I come to you and I say, hey, you need to come over to, the, uh, come over to the drag strip right over here. Since it's racing week, I'll use a racing analogy. Come over to the drag strip. I'm going to have my 2005 Nissan Frontier on there, and I'm going to race one of those big funny cars that go about 400 miles an hour. And I'm going to guarantee you $3,000 on it, I'm going to beat that drag strip car. You come to the racetrack. At the end of the race, all you see is me at the finish line and the drag strip car nowhere close. You walk up to me and you say, Michael, like how in the world did you do that? I, it don't even look like that car moved. And I said, well, let me show you something. We walk over to the drag strip car. I lift up the hood. There's no engine in it. You see, you look at the car, you know what the car is, and you think, there's no way Mike was going to beat that car with a pickup truck. But the reality is, is we never looked inside the car to see what's on the inside. Our purity is really on the inside. So here's the phrase that I want you to leave here with today. Purity begins within me. Purity begins within me. It's got a rhythm. Purity begins within me. Now, on the count of three, I want you to say it. Stretch out the word purity so you get a good rhyming rhythm with it, okay? On the count of three. One, two, three. Purity begins within me. Say it again. Purity begins within. One more again. Purity begins within me. It's not external. Purity is actually internal. But piety is not a good indicator of purity. Piety is not a good indicator of purity. Let me define piety and purity. Piety, I needed to look up pious to get this definition. And here's what pious means. It means falsely appearing, that's very external, appearing to be good or moral. Being pious or having piety is very religious. It's very much a rule-following kind of thing. Purity, however, is a lack of guilt or evil thoughts. When we think of guilt or evil thoughts, that's all internal. So piety can't be a good indicator of purity because piety is all about what I'm doing on the outside. It doesn't, it's not necessarily dictating and revealing and indicating what is going on on the inside. However, I feel like there is a word that is a great indicator of whether or not 
we're allowing purity into our life. And that word is peace. Peace. Now that's a good indicator of purity. Because when you know you're at peace, then you know you're allowing the purest things you can, God's best that he has for us. We know that we're allowing and walking that out in our lives, and we begin to experience peace. Now, I want to give a live verbal illustration of what I'm talking about, just so this really clicks and uh, just sits home and you really get it. We are made up, the Bible says, of three parts. So each of us, we have three parts within our own being. One part is our body, the other part is our soul, and the other part is our spirit. Now, our soul is made up of our mind, will, and emotions. So here's how this whole peace thing plays out in moments in life and all, out, all throughout our lives. I'm going to represent the soul, the mind, the will, and emotions. There's a door over here that I want you to imagine that is spirit. There's a door over here that represents the body. We'll call it flesh, spirit door, flesh door. We all have things that happen in life. Somebody talks bad about us, the way we were raised at home, our interaction with authority figures, adults, our interactions with people, our just frustration, whatever it is, our job, our friends, anything. There are things in life, sometimes it's just the way that we're wired as male and female, that give a, get us to a place of feeling unrest. We're uneasy. We're not at peace in that moment. Now, there's nothing wrong with this. We have a need. It's a legitimate need. It's not wrong. It's just different, and it's a need. Here's what happens. As soon as that unrest happens, both of these doors open up. And the flesh door says, come on, come on over here. I got, I got some peace for you. I can, I can calm and soothe you. The spirit door opens up. God says, hey, come over here. Come, my child. This is where you'll find your rest. So here's what happens. I choose the flesh door. The flesh door is like, come on. I got this, I got this pill you can take. Look, I got something you can drink. It'll handle everything. You know what? Just go on and yell at your kids. Who cares? Yell at them. Get it off your chest. You deserve it. It'll give you peace once you yell. You know what? Respond in anger. Just be angry about it. You know what? Go and, and write on Facebook about how you hate this or, or that church did you this or that person did you this. Just, just vent. Come on, baby. Just vent. I walk into that door. The unfortunate thing about going into that flesh door is that, first of all, I do experience a moment of peace. But the key word is, is it's a moment of peace. And no matter how many times I get it, because I will come back out of that door and beat it and rest again. And if I keep choosing that door, you would think that the more you go in that door, the more you get used to what's in there and you might want to stay a little bit. But the unfortunate thing about the, the uh, flesh door is you never gain any time while you're in there on peace. The peace always stays short. Matter of fact, you usually have to be enticed with more to get you to go in so that you experience that peace because the peace you felt at the pill now takes a whole bottle. That's the flesh door. Now, over here is the spirit door. God's saying, come and find rest. I have a quiet stream of still waters that you can come into and find rest. I want to give you rest. I choose that door, and I go in, and I experience a peace and a rest. Because I've decided to pick the purest form, God's best, and I've gone through that. Now, I will be back out at a place of unrest, no doubt. I will be. But the great thing about this door that's different from that door is the more that I pick this door, I begin to gain mileage and time on my peace. My peace begins to last longer and longer. And eventually, I get to a point where I've experienced peace at such a longevity period of time in an area of my life that... Even though I get to that moment unrest, even though I have a circumstance just like the circumstance that used to just keep me way down and keep me feeling like I couldn't get up from underneath it, the peace will supersede and override. We sang that song, I Keep My Eyes Above the Wave. That's what happens when we decide to choose purity and we experience the peace, which indicates that we are walking in purity. Remember, purity begins within me. I want to read a couple of scripture verses to you that I feel like really uh, reiterated this whole idea about our heart and this internal peace. Proverbs 14, 30, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Proverbs 27, 19, and I love this illustration in Proverbs 27, 19. It says, as a water reflects a face, so a man's heart reflects the man. 
So a woman's heart reflects the woman. What that tells me is that if I really want to see the true me and know the true who I am, then I don't need to look at my outward appearance and whether or not my clothes are ironed and my, my, uh, my, my eyebrows are tweezed and I got all the hair out of my ears because now I got hair going out of my ears. I don't need to look at all that. I need to look deep within here. That's just a mask. And God can see through that mask, and he knows whether or not we're choosing purity so that we can experience peace. And let me give you an example in my life, one of the areas of my life where I, the indicator of peace has shown me that I have been living in an area of purity and chosen purity in that particular area of my life. I, last Sunday, I had a wedding to do in the evening, and as I was going to the wedding, uh, I had this thought, and it was a very peaceful thought. And I actually sent a text to my wife, Jalay, and I told her exactly what I thought. But I thought this as I was heading to that wedding. I thought about the whole idea that I just love my marriage. Like, I love being married to this woman. Like, and I just felt the peace. And I just, as I thought in that moment, I said, I love the way we just vibe through life together. It's just like a steadiness. Now, we get frustrated each other. We bother each other. We get on each other's nerves. But... It's just a steady, like I love being around her. I love my kids. I love hanging out with them. I just love my family. I felt that peace. So what that showed me is, is that, Michael, the reason why you're feeling that peace is because you put some time in taking the choice to, to experience the purity. You've chosen purity in that area. Now, not just purity of my eyes are only for you. Is there any other women? This must be a room full of men because all I see is you. Now, that, that's part of it. That's a large part of it, but that's part of it. The, the other part of that purity is this. Ephesians 5.33, at the end of it, it gives me a simple definition of the core need of a man and a woman, and therefore, it gives me my core responsibility as a husband. Last verse in Ephesians 5, it says, Husbands, un I'm adding the word unconditionally because this is really what it means, Husbands, unconditionally love your wives, and wives, don't unconditionally love your husband, unconditionally respect your husband. You see, we as men, we know what respect is. We know how to die for our country. We know how to put our life on the line. We understand respect without even thinking about it. That's why God told us to love unconditionally, because we don't do that easily. Women, you love unconditionally. Without, I mean, you wake up and you breathe. I just know how to love. It's just there. <laughs> I mean, you nurture, nurturing gives you like second things. I, I watch what my wife does. I'm like, I don't know how she does all that. But she, you just do it. That's why God tells you to do something that's hard and doesn't make much sense to you. He says unconditionally respect. That means no matter how the other person is acting, you do what God calls you to do. We've done that, and we continue to do it. That purity has led to the peace that I find in my marriage. Purity begins within me. Now, I believe there are a lot of gates to purity, but I want to list four uh, gates to purity. And the reason why I call those gates is because a gate can be opened and closed. So these are areas in our life where we either open or close the gate to purity coming in so that we can experience the peace. The first one is what we see. The first gate is what we see. Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 through 23 says, your eyes are windows into your body. If you open your eyes wide in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. It fills up with peace because we've opened ourselves up to God's best. If you live squinty-eyed in greed and trust, then your body is a dank cellar. It's at unrest. If you uh, pull the blinds on your windows, what a dark life you will have. Now, there's this husband and wife. They wake up every morning and they go sit at their dining room table, which is right by a big bay window. Outside that window, they can see their neighbor's house and their neighbor's yard. Their neighbor likes to hang their clothes out on the clothesline to dry out on really nice, beautiful days. So they get there and they're sitting and the wife looks out and she goes, oh my gosh, Fred, look at this woman. She is out here hanging these clothes up, and they got dirt all over them. Like, just, what is she thinking? Doesn't she know the clothesline doesn't clean your clothes? No matter how clean the air feels or smells, it ain't going to clean that nasty clothes. So they wake up the next day. She looks out. 
can you believe this? This woman is, she's hanging out dirty clothes again. Somebody needs to tell her. Maybe just, I don't know what's wrong with this lady, but somebody needs to inform her. Day after day, this happens. And one day they wake up and they, they go to eat and they sit down and the wife looks out and is like, <gasps> Fred, 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 you've got to come see this. Look, Edna finally washed her clothes before she put them out on the clothesline. Look how clean they are. I guess somebody told her. Her husband looked at her and said, I woke up early before we came and sat down, and I cleaned the windows. <laughs> Perspective. Now, here's the reality of that little illustration, <laughs> is that we all, have, we all have a window of life, and there's been a lot of dirty stuff from just living life that has been put on our window, and it's very easy to continue to look through the dirt. But if we want to open the gate to purity when it comes to what we see, we need to really look beyond it and see what God has for us, not what circumstances have told us that we are to live. We need to look beyond it. So the first gate is what we see. Second gate, what we hear. What we hear. Proverbs 22, 17 through 18. Pay attention and listen. That's our, that's our ears. That's hearing. Pay attention and listen to the sayings of the wise. Apply your heart to what I teach. So we hear it. Apply it to our heart. For it is pleasing when you keep them in your heart and have all of those wise sayings ready to speak out of your lips. Now, the Bible says, out of the overflow of our heart, our mouth speaks. So what we hear plays a large role in what's molded in our heart, in the activity in our heart, which then gives us the words that are ready to speak. This scripture says, think on wise things. Now, music, I believe, is one of the most powerful tools, almost subconsciously. It goes under the radar, but it has a huge impact on us. Now, let me explain to you how music had an impact on me, and I realized that impact, and it was in a very subtle way. I'm in college, and I'm driving down the street. I'm listening to my favorite genre of music, my favorite style of music. There wasn't a whole lot of music in that genre at that time that uh, really edified God and talked about God and Bible and all that. Uh, so I was not listening to that. I was listening to stuff that edifies other things. Um, <laughs> And I'm enjoying it. It's good. I like it. It's my favorite music. So I'm driving down the road, and all of a sudden, God hit me with a reality. I knew that music was powerful, but in this moment, it sort of upped my meter for how powerful music is because I realized that just listening to that music, I wasn't flipping people off, giving them a the bird, or yelling at people. I was simply driving more aggressively, and I noticed it. I noticed that as soon as I started listening to it, I started driving more aggressively. Now, my wife would tell you that I still drive aggressively. I would say it's uh, controlled assertiveness. <laughs> but what, what this did for me in that moment is that it began to make a shift for me, and God entered a thought of purity that helped me to realize that I need to keep a high radar on what I'm letting into my ears, even down to music, and I need to make sure I'm keeping a gauge on what it's causing me to do because it's having a, an effect on the inside. What we see, what we hear, what we taste is the third gate. What we taste. Proverbs 23, 19 through 21. Listen, my son, listen, my daughter, and be wise and keep your heart on the right path. Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. For drunkards and gluttons become poor and drowsiness clothes them in rags. Now, it is important on what we eat just from a physiological, biological standpoint on keeping our heart working well, but I don't want to concentrate on that right now. What I want to concentrate on is, is the fact that a lot of the times we have to ask ourselves, what I'm putting in my mouth, am I doing it to soothe something that's unsettled in my soul? And this happened to me, and this is something I realized a few years ago as I thought about this. Here recently, over the past about eight days, I've really been trying to drink mostly water. I mean, I'll drink juice here or there, but mostly trying to be, drink water. But the biggest thing that I'm trying not to drink is the greatest soda that was ever created by the hands of a man that was created by God, <laughs> Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Just what the doctor ordered. <clears throat> so I love Dr. Pepper. And uh, I love to buy Dr. Pepper from the greatest gas station ever created by a man who was created by God, and that is QT. <laughs> Quick trip, but quality time. <clears throat> so 
So I, I love going to QT, but I, I realized before, I, I realized years ago, so it's really been, ta it's taken a number of years for me to actually act out a conviction that I've had, is I knew I needed to cut back on how much soda I was drinking. Thank God my wife doesn't bring it into the house. I'm very thankful for that. But I found myself that when I would get thirsty and I would crave and want this Dr. Pepper, sometimes it was just like, man, I could really drink a Dr. Pepper. It was just whatever. But I realized that there were other times that I craved it that I realized my thought after I craved it was, I deserve this. You know what? I've been working hard. I've been doing this. I've been giving. I've been working in my garden. I'm sweaty from cutting the grass. I deserve a Dr. Pepper because of what I've done. And I realized it became very selfish. That my choice to drink that Dr. Pepper a lot of the times had a selfish motive with it to try to soothe something in me. And so I realized real quickly that what we put in our mouth sometimes doesn't have to do with the health benefits. It has to do with what we're trying to soothe. Now, when I pass by the QT, here's the voice I hear. Hello, Michael. <laughs> this is your smooth brown brother, Dr. Pepper. Mm. Why don't you come on through here and get some, son? Drink me up. Matter of fact, you can choose whether you want crushed or cube dice. But no matter what you choose, I'm going to flow like a stream of river right over the top of that ice. Come on, Michael. I, and I did it in a very, uh, attempting a Barry White voice because, you know, when you hear Barry White songs, babies just start popping out. Okay. Uh, that, but that's how it is. It's. It's very, it's very lascivious. It's very sensual. It's like, come on and take me. Like, drink me, Michael. And I'm like, and depending on when somebody heard this message, they might not know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> anyway, but it, it really is. It's, it's what we see, uh, what we hear. That's gates, gates, people, gates, and what we taste. The last gate, the last gate is uh, what we think, what we think. Let's get back to Bible, so we'll stop goofing off. <laughs> Proverbs 23, 6 through 7. Proverbs 23, verses 6 through 7. Do not eat the bread of a man who thinks only of himself. Do not have a desire for his fine food. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. He says to you, eat and drink, but his heart is not with you. And I want to highlight the verse in there that for as a man or as he thinks or as a woman thinks, so their heart is. You know, the things that we bring into our life begin to do stuff to our heart that creates these thoughts. And thoughts are a powerful tool. Think about the quiet moments where we do the whole what if game and how our thoughts can take us to a place of stress. And God is saying, look, my burden is easy and light. Come and rest. Thoughts are a huge gate where we decide, are we going to allow purity to be there? Or are we going to let our past and circumstances dictate what we think about ourselves? Purity begins within me. Now, I want to read a story from the Bible about this lady, and it's in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, it's going to be verses 24 through 34, but I want to set up what's going on before we get into this particular detail about the lady that we're going to talk about. Jesus is sitting there, and one of the rulers of the synagogues, they come to him, his name is Jairus, and he says, hey, my daughter is sick, uh, and I need you to come heal her. She's dying. So we pick up the story with Jesus accepting uh, that opportunity to perform a miracle and walking with him. And it says this in verse 24. So Jesus went with him, and a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Now, I want to pause right here because I want us to really understand what's going on. When it says this woman was subject to bleeding, it wasn't like she was bleeding in her arm or her finger. This was that time of the month where you ladies know that you have your menstrual cycle. That's the type of bleeding that it was talking about. Now, back in her time, she was considered unclean. So here's what it meant for someone who was unclean that dealt with this issue of bleeding that was going through their menstruation. It was this. For seven days, a woman, during that time, she was considered unclean. Anybody that touched her was considered unclean until evening. Everything she sat on, unclean. Everything she laid on, unclean. This lady had been going through this for 12 years. 12 years. A lot of people at this time, a lot of women that had to go through this and were considered unclean, most of them would even stay in their home so they could just avoid contact 
with people. So 12 years is going on with potentially a lady having to be a prisoner to her home because of this. Now let's pick up the story. Uh, in verse 27, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I could just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Sounds a lot like peace, right? At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see, the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. I read this story because I feel like there's a lot of good points and analogies in this story that are the same as what it takes for us to experience purity. So from this story, I want to share with you three, th three things that it takes for us to experience purity and therefore have peace. The first one is determination determination. Now, I mentioned that this lady more than likely spent most of her time locked up in her home because of this bleeding, because of the, the unclean thing. But you also have to wonder and realize what were her thoughts while she was in there. Most of the people in that area, they knew exactly who she was. It wasn't like now. It was a town where they knew exactly what was going on. Probably talked about her, probably said, no, no, get away from her. Don't get close to her. Can you imagine the thoughts sitting in her home, isolated by herself, couldn't be by anyone? Can you imagine the torment of potentially what was going on in her mind? It doesn't say that, but I have to only imagine and sort of get in and try to live with the text that obviously there was a lot that was holding her back. There were thoughts, there were the, the length of time that she'd been going through this that could have kept her cooped up in her home that day, but no, she decided to get out because she had a determination. And when she got out of her house, Jesus hadn't just come through the, the alley and was by himself. No, that was a crowd of people. She had been bleeding for 12 years. There's no telling how weak she felt. She might not have had all of her strength, but there's a crowd of people and she's trying to get to Jesus. Purity is the same way. It takes a great determination, a determination beyond our circumstance. The second thing it takes is faith. It takes faith. In verses 27 and 28, it says, when she heard, everybody shout heard, heard, about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. If that's not a faith couple of statements, I don't know what is. It says she heard. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, she had heard about what Jesus had been doing, no doubt, because it was spreading everywhere like wildfire. So she had heard his ability, and she possibly even thought, you know what? I remember the prophets of old said there was this guy coming who was going to be the redeemer, who was going to set the captives free, who was going to be the Messiah. Wonder if this is the guy, this is the king of the Jews. He's the one. So she heard all this, but I love it because she didn't sit there and go, man, this is really cool. Jesus is here during my lifetime. That's cool. I'm going to stay cooped up in my house because I got this 12-year deal. No, no. Faith is active. If you read James, he makes it clear that it's active. She got up and she walked to get to the crowd. You see, every bit of her circumstance could have kept her looking at the waves crashing. But again, like that song, she took her eyes above the waves and she said, I believe. I don't know if the outcome is going to be what I think it is. But I believe there is something pure out there that is my answer. Now, as I, as I begin to think more about this story, I wondered if as she walked to go to Jesus, you know, how did she have the strength? If the crowd was really that thick, how did she have the strength to push and get there? I have to imagine and wonder that if when people saw her coming, if they didn't sort of move a little bit, and she, she had somewhat of a clear path to Jesus. The very thing that had held her down was the vehicle that allowed her to get to the one who could heal her. It takes determination. It takes great faith. And it also takes the power of God. The power of God. Verse 30. 
At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? Jesus is on his way to perform a whole different miracle. Doesn't have anything to do with this lady. One powerful thing about this story is that he stopped because there was a need in that moment. What that reveals to me is that part of the power of God is that it doesn't matter what you think he's wrapped up with or who you think he's thinking about. The moment that you and I decide to get some purity from him, he's going to stop and he's going to handle his business because we are his business and we are his children and he loves us. The other great thing about the power of God is that we don't have to do anything to receive that power. Let me rephrase that. We don't have to get everything fixed up and together to receive that power. This lady didn't sit in her house and get all cleaned up, washed up, cover her face so maybe people didn't know who she was, really wrap herself up well so nobody would know that she had an issue of blood. She, she didn't do all that. She walked out just as she was. And she walked to the one who could change her from who she was to who she was created to be. The one who could redeem that area of her life, meaning making back to the right way in the way that it was intended to be from the beginning, from God's purest best when he designed you and me. And that's the same offer that God gives us today. If you will, stand to your feet. And as you stand to your feet, I want you to close your eyes and I just want you to think and let God just be there with you. Don't talk. Don't just, just be within yourself and within your thoughts. And as you close your eyes, I want you to think about what has, what has got you at a place of unrest. What has you at a place of unrest? And, and think about in that area, have, you, have, have we been choosing the flesh door more than the spirit door? Today's a day where we can make a stance and say, you know what? I'm going to bust the spirit door wide open because I'm going to have the faith that it takes. I'm going to have the determination. I'm going to put my eyes above what's going on. And I'm going to get to the one who can change my circumstance, who can clean the glass on the window, who can allow me to sing clean. And God, I know this, that this hurt and this pain and this thing that's been holding me down, that I'm going to use it as a vehicle to get to you today. And I'm not going to let it keep me from getting to you. I'm not going to try to get it cleaned up. I'm not going to try to get it together. I'm just going to get out and go and get you. If you're here today and there's an area in your life where you go, God, I'm in unrest. And I might feel good right now, but I know that unrest is waiting for me around the corner. And it's been a cycle of unrest in that area. If that's you and you know there's an area where you need to choose purity so you can experience peace, I just want you to shoot your hand up real quick. Just shoot it up. Let's see hands going up. Shoot it up real high. And you can put your hand down once you put it up. That right there tells God that, God, I'm choosing the spiritual door. I'm choosing your best. God, I thank you for those hands that were raised. I thank you for the people that, that in their heart that recognize and will begin to take action and say, God, I choose your best. I choose purity. And God, I know that as they choose it, you're going to allow them to experience peace. It might just be the first taste of peace, but God, when they get a taste, they're going to want the whole thing and they're going to come back for more and come back for more. And when we come back for more, God, you're faithful to give us that stream and that meadow, that rest. You're faithful to give us something that we thought we could never had that goes beyond our circumstances and our feelings because that's what your peace does. It surpasses all that. God, give that to those people as they begin to take action and take steps. God, thank you for their willingness to love you and to go after you and to hear your voice and to answer your call. Now, maybe there are some of you here today that when you think about your life and you think about this flesh door and this spirit door, it really feels like the spirit door that you has never been opened or you've never heard the voice calling or maybe you've never chosen to hear it. You just spend all your time in the flesh door. And what, what I mean by that is that maybe you just never have had a relationship with the one who can give you peace. The one that in the middle of a storm is sleeping on a boat because he is peace embodied in reality. Maybe you've never chosen to have a relationship with that, with the one who created you. If you're here today and you say, I want a real relationship with God and I've never really allowed the spirit door to have any kind of voice in my life, but today's the day that's gonna change. If that's you, Take both your hands and just put them on your heart, right on your chest. 
just put them there just as an act to God. I see your hands, young lady. You too, young lady. Thank you. I see your hands, sir. Put them there. And as you put them there, I want you to feel God's peace come over you because it's a decision that will change you. Everybody repeat this, this after me, including the ones that put their hands on their chest. Say, God, I love you. Thank you for this moment. I'm responding because I feel your presence in my life. Give me peace. I've been in unrest, but I need your peace. I choose you today because I believe Jesus died for me and I receive that in the depth of my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Y'all give it up for the people that made decisions. So if if you made a first-time decision today, this is your first time starting a relationship with God, there's a connect card that you heard about during the welcome on your note sheet. Just make note of that. I think it's on the back side. And then go out to our welcome center. They just have a gift they want to give you. If you have questions, they'll talk to you. Um, But it's very important that you just kind of begin to know, okay, what are my next steps? And some of those things will help you in that. Uh, Hey, y'all, I appreciate y'all on a Memorial Day weekend coming and being here with us. as you leave today, look at, just look at anybody and just say, purity begins within me. You are dismissed. <laughs>